Morning, church. Should we stand? Do you want to open your Bibles with me to Psalm 22? Uh, obviously, we're in the run-up to Easter now. Easter is fast approaching, um, and I've been loving uh, some teaching that I've been listening to about finding Jesus in the Old Testament in prophecy um, and and like foreshadows of who He is. And it's just been filling my heart with with wonder for how God has orchestrated the Scriptures to tell us about Jesus. So Psalm 22. Um, This is the psalm that Jesus quoted on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if we read on, it has such perfectly specific prophecies about what happened to Jesus. Verse 16, they pierce my hands and my feet. Verse 17, people stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Um, So much in here that depicts what Jesus went through both physically and sort of spiritually and mentally on the cross, and it just leaves me humbled. And then uh, later on from verse 22, thereabouts, um, David turns to praise and the praise that is due to the one who was afflicted uh, for what he did for us. So I want to read a few verses of this uh, to inspire us before we start. Verse 22 of Psalm 22. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I'll fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. On to verse 30. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. We are that people that at the time, obviously, were yet unborn. These words written over 500 years before the pr- uh, Jesus presents himself in a human body on earth, uh, so perfectly laying out what he did and calling all future generations to praise for what he's done. Uh, so we have a new song this morning in the run-up to Easter. Uh, just, to, uh, just to encourage us to stand in awe before Jesus and who he is and what he's done. So let me pray for us. Close your eyes. Ask the Holy Spirit to just fill your heart with wonder and awe and thanksgiving to Jesus for who he is, for who you are, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us, that you were scorned, you were despised, everything that we deserve for our sin and our turning away from God and prioritizing ourselves over you, Lord. You took that. We praise you this morning as the instrument of our righteousness, as the way by which we can come before our Father. I have nothing of my own that merits me before you, God yet you paid such a high price for me. Jesus, we thank you for orchestrating history, for orchestrating scripture to point towards who you are and what you're going to do. We proclaim your goodness. We are that people who are told uh, about your righteousness. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Jesus, it is finished. We look to you and you alone. You are worthy of our praise. We proclaim your righteousness this morning and we are glad for who you are and what you've done for us.
your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like Ephesians about um, how the Holy Spirit is left as a deposit on our inheritance. Jesus is the one who earns all the riches and all the glory and the perfection and the goodness, and the presence of God. But he gives that to us. He allows us to share in his inheritance in what is rightfully his. God, we thank you and we praise you for uh, leaving us with the Holy Spirit. We praise you, Holy Spirit, as God on earth now, God with us in our hearts, with the power to move and to the power to change. And I thank you that you love to remind us of who our God is and stir up love and affection for us. It's a powerful prayer to say, Holy Spirit, help me to love my God more. Who among us doesn't need to say that prayer every single day? And how good is the God who promises to help us love him more and more every day?
down before you even though we know when we say that we're not going to get it right but we lean on your grace we trust in your grace we lean not on our own strength we trust in your power and your strength we trust in your heart for us lord jesus let me read a little bit of ephesians 1 to close us maybe you want to open there with me uh this is ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 i pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. I'm going to read that again. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Verse 21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Jesus, we stand in awe of your power and we we kneel humbled that that power that rose you from the grave is present in us working for our good. We delight in being your body. We honor you as our head. We give you our love and our praise and our adoration this morning. In your name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. That was awesome. Cheers, Tim and Tasha. Um, that was great. And welcome to you again. It's really great to have you join us today. Um, if you are new to Cornerstone Church Online and you're visiting us for the first time, then it'd be great to get to know more about you. So please hit the visitor's card button in your chat feed and that way the church can get in t- contact with you and we can get to know a little bit more about you. If you have been visiting for some time, and you would like to stay up to date with everything that's going on at Cornerstone Church, then please hit the Sign Me Up for the latest news button, and that way the church can keep you up to date with everything that is going on. Also, if you would like to come into the building, then please check your inbox for an email from the church about how you can get an in-person ticket and do that as quickly as you can. That would also be great. 
Furthermore, giving back to God and the work of Cornerstone, everything is done electronically now. So remember, don't just give under obligation, but rather give with a joyful heart. Um, and if you'd like to give to the church, then please give via bank transfer. You can also hit the Give button. It will take you to a page on Church Suite where you can give a one-off donation. Um, upcoming events, so please get your wee diaries out or your calendar or however you remember events that are going on. I often rely upon my wife to do that. Uh, she has an amazing memory. So, But I would suggest you note these down because otherwise you're going to forget. So we have a giving day coming up. That is Sunday, the 2nd of May. So please note that. The building fund has risen to 73,000 thanks to your incredible generosity and the generosity of the whole church family. Thank you so much for that. We are aiming as a church to raise a further £30,000 to put down a healthy deposit on a building that we can hopefully call home. So let's please prepare our hearts to give generously on that giving day uh, and pursue the vision of Cornerstone Church together. So that is Sunday the 2nd of May. Please note that down in your week calendars or diaries or so on. Another date for the diary is Saturday the 17th of July and that is going to be an introduction to church planting day. The aim of this day is to inspire and inform and invite as many people as you can think of about church planning. Uh, everybody's invited. And if you'd like to go along, then please email Pete Cornford on Pete at RedeemerLondon.org. I will repeat that again for you. That is Pete at RedeemerLondon.org. If you'd like to know more about that, then please email him. Last thing, um, if you have not sent in a selfie of yourself and you would like to do so, then please send in a selfie or update the picture. I actually need to do that because I, as a joke, took a picture of Sasha. She was on a night shift and she was sleeping next to me and I thought, this is really funny. I'm going to make it look like she's sleeping through church. And that's gone on for far too long. It's been up for like six months now. And every time I see it, I feel like a tinge of shame. So I'm going to need to do that. <laughs> um, please update, send in your updated church selfies. That would be great. And um, before I hand over to Mike, um, we're going to hear from Sarah. And she's going to read from Romans chapter 2, verse 17 to chapter 3, verse 8. Thanks, guys. But if you call yourself a Jew, and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent, because you were instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For, as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So, if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written the code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? 
I speak in a human way. By no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my life God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying? Their condemnation is just. Good morning. Thank you, Sarah, for reading the passage for us today. As you might have gathered, we are in Romans, and we are in Romans chapter 2. We continue with our series, uh, Righteousness for the Unrighteous. And uh, this morning, my plan is to preach a little bit shorter. And I know that is quite hard, maybe, for a preacher. Uh, But the reason being is that we have a little announcement that we want to share with you at the end of our service regarding our building. And I know that some of you attended Our all-church Zoom last Sunday was so good to see so many of you um, on that service that was on that Zoom call. It was so awesome. But since that Sunday, there has been some advancements and some change that we wanted to kind of update you all as a church. And rather than having another another Zoom, we thought we'd just do that after this meeting. But for now, it's Romans chapter two, and we need the Spirit's help this morning as we continue to make our way through His Word. So why don't I pray for us, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this man, Paul, that You anointed and called to be a church planner, an encourager, a speaker of the truth. And as he highlights the, the gospel and, and the goodness of who You are as he preaches and, and writes this letter to this church, we thank You that it is relevant and applicable for our lives today. Spirit of God, I ask that you would open up our hearts, reveal to us the truth that we need, and apply that to our hearts so that we would see change and transformation come in a lasting way. We ask all of this in your precious Son, Jesus' name. And Everyone said, Amen. So last time I preached, I'm not sure if you can remember, but I used the Titanic as part of my analogy. And a really well-known statement that has so often been used and spoken about in movies and whatever else when they used to describe the Titanic is the saying that it was safe. The Titanic was as safe as houses, so safe that not even God could sink the Titanic. And today we come to this last section of chapter 2, and Paul is continuing to push home this message that just because you and I might feel safe, that doesn't mean that we are safe. Let me say that, let me say, say that again. Just because we might feel safe doesn't necessarily mean that you are safe. See, the builders of the Titanic thought that the ship was so safe that they didn't need to put in uh, more lifeboats on it. By putting more on them, uh, more lifeboats on the boat, they thought that would take up unnecessary space. And so they only put half of the amount of life rafts on the boat. So confident were they in the structure and the, the ship of the Titanic. And as we all know, that decision by those shipbuilders had devastating consequences because for all of those passengers on the Titanic, they might have felt safe as they boarded the ship, but that didn't mean that they were safe when it really mattered. It may seem strange to us that Paul would devote a couple of chapters demonstrating your and my sinfulness, the sinfulness of people. One would surely think that it is far better for a man to rather take us to a nice streams of flowing water, a brook that is so refreshing, and let us camp around the good news of the gospel, you know, helping people to see the good news and just to feel positive about ourselves and just make us feel good about ourselves. And certainly as a church leader and preacher, preaching the first two chapters of Romans, I must say, has been tough going because it feels like Paul is really laying into us as the people of God. But I think that there are some profound 
reasons why Paul is doing this. Why he is lingering over the sinfulness of the Gentiles and of the Jews. And for the last few weeks we have said that until we see the depth of our depravity, until we see the depth of our sinfulness, we will not truly see the height of our salvation. I think that one of the reasons why Paul is harping on this is because the gospel of justification by grace through faith alone does not always land on us in an overwhelming good news kind of way. It's become so familiar to us. I made a point a couple of weeks ago that we could never graduate or move on from the gospel message. Does the gospel message, when it lands on you, bring you to, oh, just thank you, God, or is it just washing over you? Maybe we as believers have become blind to the fact that we are sinful. We are resistant to seeing that. We are resistant to feeling that we are a sinful people. Remember who Paul is writing to. He's writing to the church in Rome, and the church in Rome had both Jews and Gentiles in it. The Jewish Christians were these religious group of the church, the ones who were raised up in a Jewish culture and had come to seeing Jesus as the Savior, but hadn't quite grasped the fullness of God's grace and His mercy. And so they're carrying across all of the traditions from the past, from their previous, or from their upbringing, from their previous religious experiences, and they're bringing it, kind of importing it into a Christian context. Reminds me of a parable that Jesus told about a father who had two sons. You'll know this really well. It's called the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son. And the younger brother asks for his inheritance from his father early. And the father gives it to him. But unfortunately, what the younger brother does is that he goes on a bender. He kind of squanders all of his wealth only to return back to his father and his older brother and the farm that they had as a family. And as the younger brother returns, the father welcomes the younger son or the younger brother back with open arms and kind of celebrates his return to the extent that he reinstates him as a co-heir with his older brother and the family inheritance. In other words, at that moment, that older brother, his inheritance was halved by the fact that the brother went early and took the inheritance. And it was halved again when the father reinstated him back into the family. You could see how this would really upset the older brother, that the, the way in which the father welcomed the younger brother back in. You see, the older brother was this responsible type, the one who stayed at home and worked hard and, and did everything to please his father. So that when this younger brother came back, it's really understandable why he would be so upset. He was outraged that the father would just, yeah, come back in, ring on the finger, cloak, kill the fatted calf, party for everyone. And the older brother is really upset. And I think that this character of the older brother is so descriptive of some of us. Some of us are older brothers. I put my hand up. When we've done as a, as a gospel community, we went through that parable uh, we took a couple of weeks, about six weeks, and to really dive deep into it and look at it. I am classic older brother. We, people like myself, we typified the Jewish Christians that Paul is laying into in the passage today. We like to obey the rules. There's not that much that we rarely do wrong. We, we often stand on the sidelines and we kind of hump at our younger brothers that kind of, and the way in which they behave and the way in which they conduct themselves. I live in Jesmond. I get a, an opportunity to do that quite often with the people that live in my area. We'll just call them the younger group that um, 
are not necessarily too COVID aware and just carry on as if life were back pre-COVID days. And I can be very older brother-like. And the other yesterday we were having a nap, which we don't often do on a Saturday afternoon. It was amazing. The window open, a crack, the breeze blowing through. And all I could hear was these younger people racing their cars up and down my street. And I was like getting so wide up. And then there's like groups of them running down the street. Ah! I'm like, Isla and I are like, I want to get up and I want to go and ask them for their mother's phone number. And I'm going to call them and tell them and just tell them off because we're so classic older brother. Oh, you not obeying the rules. You know what the COVID guidelines are like. Classic older brother. We love to keep the law. We pride ourselves in the fact that we keep the law. And we love to call out our other brothers and sisters when they step out of line. And the problem with us older brother types is that we very seldom see the wrong in our own lives. It's always everyone else. And if I had to ask you today, hey, what is the sin areas in your life? Would you struggle to kind of pinpoint what they are? What are those areas of sin in your life? Oh, cool. good question. Um, uh, huh. Yeah, I'll come back to you. Classic older brother, because generally we live quite good, morally, morally good lives. On the flip side... The younger brother types, you know exactly what the sin areas of your life are. Because when you sin, you sin properly. You know the areas of your life where there is sin. And Paul is, in chapter 2, he's talking to us older brother types, the self-righteous Jewish Christian. And he is mid-flight between chapter 1 en route to chapter 3. He's coming t from that great gospel statement of uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, which says, The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith. And he's aiming at Romans chapter 3 and verse 9, which says, What then? Are we... Meaning, are we Jews or are we older brothers better than the Gentiles or the younger brothers? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jew and Greek, here's the kicker, are under sin. Both Jew and Greek, both older brother and younger brother, we are all under sin. Sin And Paul's aim of chapters 1 and 2 is to show that both Jews, older brothers, and Gentiles, younger brothers, are all under sin. Remember, the, um, the Jewish Christians wanted the Gentile Christians to take on their traditions, take on their practices. Paul has his sights kind of squarely fixed on these religious Christian men and women. He is wanting to make them aware of the painful diagnosis of the disease of sin and their need of the gospel of justification by grace through faith. So chapter 2 and verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew... If you want in your Bibles, you can write Christian above the Jew. But if you call yourself a Christian and you rely upon the law, remember for the Jews, the law was, was the word of God and the obedience to the law. And that kind of earned your right standing before God. If you were a good Jewish man or woman and you obeyed the law, you stood in right standing before God, break it, you're out. But if you call yourself a Christian and you rely upon the word, and you boast in God, and you know His will and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in the darkness, 
an instructor of the foolish and a teacher of the children, having the law, um, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach other brothers, you then who teach others, classic older brother, you then who teach others, here it is, do you teach yourself? Ugh. See, Paul is highlighting something that is so common amongst those of us who are very similar to these religious Jewish Christians or these older brother types. Those of us who love and desire knowledge. Those of us who read and believe the Bible is God's words and we think that this knowledge and this revelation that we have, we just love it so much and we, and we think it's our business to set each other right rather than repenting ourselves and allowing when we kind of read the Word of God. And when you do your devotional and your Bible reading, you do it because you have to. This is what a Christian does. Because you know it's the right thing to do and those things are true. They are right. But is your intent when you read for it to read you? Or is it to read to gain knowledge? Or read to tick the box? Or read to instruct others? Paul is saying, do you do these things? You boast in God. He says, you know His will. You approve of what is excellent. In other words, you approve and you applaud those people who, who keep the law and who do good. Oh my goodness, as a parent, I totally identify with this because our kids are such great examples because when they are good and they are well behaved, they could ask us for anything. And I'll be like, yes, my son, what would you like? Can, can I have ice cream? Absolutely. And as we'd say, yeah, sure. Can I have that? Yeah, you've just been such... It's so easy for us to be so generous to our kids when they're obedient and they're keeping the law that we've set for our home. Watch wonderful children. But boy, oh boy, let the kids step out of line. Let them start breaking the rules that we have set down and mom and dad start wrath comes out. To the point, Christmas is cancelled. No university for you. Everything is gone. It's like wrath, older brother. Break the rules. Step out of line. Boom. This is what Paul is saying. You approve what is excellent. You're a guide to the blind, meaning that you help others to see God. You are a light to those in the darkness. You're a sterling example of a Christian moral character. You're an instructor to the foolish. You're a teacher of the children, those who are young in their faith. You help them. You embody the law of God. And at this point, you're like, yes, that's me, Paul. All of those things. Applaud the good. Help those are lost. Be a light. Good moral character. But you fail to allow it to touch you. You fail to allow it to affect the change that is necessary in you because we don't think that we need it. It's everyone else. Everyone else needs to be changed. You and I are God's gift to the world as a change agent that they all so desperately need. And Paul is saying to us that you are so busy helping and teaching others that you forget to teach yourself. And what ends up happening is that the law becomes a means of our boasting and not as a means of love, which its intention was. Because, you see, love uses truth to bless others, but sin uses truth to exalt itself. Both use truth. One just has got no life in it. Paul continues, he drills down deeper into his illustration of wanting to kind of illustrate to us this failure of being able to see that we are in desperate need of allowing the Word to teach us, to read us. 
Verse 21. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed amongst the Gentiles because of you. Now, I'm not sure about you, but upon reading those few verses, I can say, hmm, none of those really apply to me. But before you move on, older brother, religious Christian, what if we rarely do do those things? What if for a moment I had an opportunity to play a public video of your life of the past six weeks for everyone to view online? Do I get any takers? They want to sign up? Classic older brothers? Yeah, 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 pick me. <laughs> Who wants to sign up for that? Who'll be willing for for us to kind of scroll your thoughts for the last six weeks and put them up on the slides of the TV. You see, Paul, in this moment, he is concerned with the state of our hearts. He's concerned with the state of the heart of the believer. Your life is not just shaped by what you know. Your life is not just shaped by your experiences, but your life is shaped also by the condition of your heart. And you might dismiss those things, those Paul has listed them because they're in the, in the law. You know, love the Lord your God. You'll have no other idols before me. Do not murder. Do not steal. So he's kind of listing those things and saying to them, do you do them? And think back to Jesus with, in Matthew chapter 5 when he speaks to the Pharisees and he says, You say, do, that, um, do not commit adultery, but I say that the man who has looked at a woman in a lustful way has committed adultery where in his heart. And so Paul is wanting to get to the root of it. He's digging behind the outward manifestation that we so often only Look at, he's wanting to get to the condition of our hearts. The one thing that you and I will never be able to escape is our hearts. If you leave, if you run away from this building today and you never come back, here's a news flash, your heart will go with you. You don't leave your heart behind. You always take your heart with you. Your heart always follows you. And these things that Paul is listing here are heart conditions, and he is expressing them in an outward manifestation of a breaking of the law. He says, do you tell others to obey the law, but you yourself don't obey it? Which he means that you know the law, you know all the do's and don'ts. And on one level, you kind of keep those things, but at the level that really matters, at the essential level, the level of the heart, that is where it breaks down. Outwardly, yes. Inwardly, no go. Which in effect is adultery. Because we give our hearts, we give our trust, that thing that only belongs to God, that worship, that love, that adoration that only belongs to God, we give it to another. We take the idols of this world and we make them our own. As if to kind of rob the temples of this world because God Himself is not good enough for us. And Paul's purpose in this chapter is to highlight the need of the Jewish people along with, um, along with us. He's wanting to show us that this gift of righteousness that God gives is freely given to every man and woman. Self-righteous Christian, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. And the only way that you are righteous is not by your obedience to the law. 
It's not by any act or deed or by your own, but it is by Christ alone, through Christ alone. He then moves on, verse 25. For circumcision is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes an uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Blood of circumcision. Sounds very painful. Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. If you have your Bibles out, underline this. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, or not by the law. His praise is not from man, but from God. You see, for the Jews and the Jewish Christians, their obedience to the law, their morality was their saviour. I'm a good person. I've, of course I'm going to go to heaven. They placed such high value on the importance of external things like circumcision. And if you are a Gentile and you want to follow Christ, and you want to be a Christian, well then, guys, you too would need to be circumcised. That is, I'm not saying that, that's what the Jews were saying in that day. But Paul is saying here, it's not circumcision that saves you. Verse 28, for no one is a Jew who is one merely outwardly. The outward manifestation of your Jewishness does not make you Jewish. He goes one step further and says, nor is circumcision outward or physical. What does he mean? Verse 29, a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision, that thing that you think that will save you or that thing that you think that identifies you as a Jew, circumcision rather is a matter of the heart. Circumcision or salvation is a matter of the heart. And how does this circumcision of the heart happen? Well, it's got nothing to do with you and I. Newsflash. If your salvation had anything to do with you, it would be an opportunity to take credit for it. And Paul says your salvation is a matter of the heart by the Spirit and not by the law. Obedience to the law will not save you. Being a good Christian will not save you. Being baptized will not save you. Taking communion each Sunday will not save you. Reading your Bible every day will not save you because salvation has to do with our hearts by the Spirit of God and only because of what Jesus has done for us. Sure, reading your Bible is good because it changes and transforms your heart, but don't turn it into a legalistic ritual. As an, Rather, access it as an opportunity to just allow God to minister to you. Does that mean that you don't need to be baptized or do good things? No, not, not at all. Absolutely, please do those things. Of course we do them. But the motivation behind doing them, our hearts uh, behind doing them is motivated not out of earning salvation points on the scoreboard in heaven, but out of love for God and out of love for our neighbor as we do them. The point is that a person is a true part of God's redeemed family if their heart is circumcised by the Spirit to love God. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, this is what God promises His children. He says, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Picture this just for a moment. If our hearts are over here, and if I can, this is in the camera. If our hearts are over here, and God is up at the top, um, then what is in between God and our hearts 
is the law. So you've got our heart at the bottom, you've got God's, God's law in the middle, and then you've got God at the top. And the ultimate aim of the law here in the middle was to bring our hearts up into personal relationship with, of, of love and just communion and trust and obedience with God. That was the purpose of the law. But for many people, we've turned God's word, we've turned the law into a list of do's and don'ts, rules for, for godly living. And what we kind of do is we kind of measure ourselves against these do's and don'ts. And we either feel good about ourselves or we feel terrible about ourselves. There's something missing in that whole equation. In verse 29, Paul says that it is um, the spirit that is the most important part of this whole equation. And so it is the spirit, that job, that takes this law and kind of imprints it upon our upon our hearts. He kind of writes God's Word upon our, our hearts so that we, we love God's Word. It becomes a part of us rather than just being some like external thing. The Spirit comes and takes God's Word and, and, and works it into our hearts, bringing change and transformation. And it is also the, the Spirit of God that then takes our hearts um, through the law of God up just to see and have relationship with the Father. See, this is the ultimate goal of the law. It's that we would have a personal relationship of love with God through His Word. Don't chuck the baby out with the bathwater. We need the Spirit of God to reveal these things and imprint it upon our heart. You see, without the Spirit, we either reject the law of God or we change it into something that we can manage. And in both cases, that is wrong. The law minus the spirit equals this external religious ritual like circumcision, which leads to the praise of man. But the law plus the spirit equals this internal circumcision of the heart, which leads to the praise of God. Even if no one on this earth ever says to you, hey, well done. Let's be men and women who seek and cherish the work of the Spirit of God in our lives. Your and my salvation is dependent upon the work of the Spirit circumcising our hearts to love God. Writing this law on our hearts, freeing us from seeking the approval of man. And all of this, Jesus did for us on the cross when He shed His blood for us so that we can come into relationship with God. If today you are visiting us and you are checking out what it means to follow Jesus, hey, I'm just so glad that you joined us today. You're so welcome. The take-home message for you today is that you will never be good enough. There is no amount of good deeds that you can do that will ever earn you right standing with God. There's no amount of good deeds that you could do that could pay for all of the wrong that you have done in your life. But I've also got some good news for you today. There is a way that you can have right standing with God. There is a way that you can have the slate wiped clean. The Bible says that we deserved death for what we've done. We've exchanged the worship of the uncreated one, meaning God. We exchanged the worship of God, and in this place we have worshipped created things. That's what the Bible calls sin. All of us. Don't feel like you're alone. Every single human being on this earth today is guilty of that. But that is why God sent His Son, Jesus. The only perfect man who walked the earth. And when Jesus died on the cross for you, He took the judgment for your sin, which was death, and He exchanged it and He gave you life. In other words, He died the death that you deserved for your sin. 
and in return, He gave you life. And as we heard today, this is only possible through the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. So if you're watching and you have this overwhelming sense of God drawing you unto Himself, calling you to confess that you have misplaced your worship of everything else instead of Him, then come today and put your faith in His saving grace and receive His free gift of salvation today. If today you are a Christian, the message to you is you're a sinner saved by grace. The law, the Word of God, the Bible, Bible knowledge, being a good Christian, doing your Bible reading every day is not what saves you. If you were asked where your sinfulness is, would you know or are you blind to that fact? But you're very good at pointing it out to other people, helping them, but you neglect to acknowledge it happening in your own life. Being a Christian is a matter of the heart. Have you given your heart and worship to another? On the outside, you might be able to fool everyone. Maybe you come to church each, each week, you sign on to the service. Maybe you attend gospel community. Maybe you even tithe, but on the inside, your heart has grown cold. You're merely just going through the motions. Today, the Spirit of God is calling you back unto Himself. Relationship and salvation is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit and not by the law, and it's obedience. Stop seeking the approval of man. Stop seeking the well done from others. You have it from God because of what Jesus has done for you. Rejoice in that today. Can I encourage you in the coming days, the coming weeks, share this good news with a friend. Share what God has done in your life today with someone else that needs to hear it. Let us be a light that shines in the darkness, a guide to the blind, not because I've asked you to do it, but because of what has been achieved for you in Jesus, that your acceptance is secure. I'm going to invite Tim and Tash, and we are going to stand, and we are going to worship, we are going to sing. There are people that are waiting for you online that would love to pray with you. Uh, wherever you find yourself today, in whatever position that you would like someone to pray with you about, maybe you're like, yeah, that's me, I need Jesus. Hit the button that says, I want to put my faith in Jesus. If you want someone to pray with you, hit that button part also in the chat that moments that says, please pray with me. There's guys that would love to spend some time and pray with you. Maybe even if you're on and you feel a bit embarrassed to maybe hit the chat button and get someone to pray with you, why don't you text a friend? Why don't you call a friend this afternoon and say, pray with me, please. Let's reach out to one another and let's press into what Jesus has done for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work of the Spirit and what that does to us. We thank you, Spirit of God, that you take the revelation of the word of God. We take God's law and we ask that you write it upon our hearts, that it would act as a witness to our conscience. That leads us to repentance, not to feeling judged. God, help us to be men and women of grace. Men and women of truth. Men and women of love. Help us to also acknowledge our own sinfulness, that as we read your word, that it would read us. It would lead us to repentance. It would lead us to see the greatness of who you are and what you have done for us, Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord. Amen. Thanks to Matash.
in ancient history, foretold, promised, you who was delivered, who came humble, meek, lowly, as a servant, all the glory of God compressed into human form, what a wonder, you who was given up to death on a cross, the only perfect, righteous man dying a criminal's death mocked for what we had done. You who was raised again in glory, who death could not defeat, who was lifted high for all to see. You who sealed that promise and promised us eternal life with you, we who could have done nothing to deserve it. Jesus, who will one day come again in glory and in power, unmistakably the Son of God, the King of Heaven. We praise you, we thank you, and we turn our eyes off of ourselves and onto you, upwards to you, our Lord Jesus. Thanks to Matash. That was great. So uh, we said we wanted to have a quick announcement after church. So uh, before you dash up and take the Sunday dinner out the oven, um, I hope it doesn't burn. Turn the oven down. Give us another 10 minutes. 
just quickly some announcement about the building. Like I said in the beginning, I do apologize. I don't want to keep you in suspense and keep you all the way to the end of the service, not the marketing ploy, but we just didn't want you to kind of think about it throughout the rest of our service, let it preoccupy your, your thoughts. Um, like I said last Sunday, we spoke about the building. We were really uh, just kind of looking forward to the 24th of May where we would uh, had planned to go back into the main space where we've always met as a church because that's when conference centers and stuff could open up. And we we're just really looking forward to that. I also had spoken about, we'd always known being in Bamber House, I don't know if you've ever been in the building, but it's not a great building. It doesn't look beautiful. It's, it's in a really sorry state. But the reason why us and um, the building landlords have never really invested in the space is that it was always earmarked for demolition. So all of us in this building, we've always known it will come down at some point. And I think every year we think, is this the year it's going to come down? Which is, wow, we've had such a big motivator for a building fund. And we've always wanted to move out of this space because we just knew it was never really going to be our, our home for a long time. Um, but at the very least, what we had thought was that we would get six months notice. Because that was a part of our contract when we joined the building with the landlord, is that we would get six months notice when we have to move out of this space. But on Monday evening, I received an email from the, the, our landlord for this building uh, of an eviction notice out of this building. And so the demolition has been approved for this whole corner. If you've been part of the city center, uh, been down here at any time in the last uh, month and a half, you would notice a lot of buildings are coming down and things are moving swiftly uh, in the city center. And so uh, they've approved the demolition of this building, uh, and uh, so our eviction notice is uh, in three weeks' time, <laughs> and it's not in six months that we had always originally had planned, hoped, and thought about. Uh, so they've given us um, four weeks, which by the point that I'm telling you, it's now three weeks um, about having to be out of this space, but... Before you panic, uh, before you can pour yourself a whiskey, don't worry, don't panic. Uh, no need to fear, no need to worry, because we serve a God who is in control of all things, even these seemingly bad things, even bad things in our life, God is able to use for good, and in His eyes, they're good things. And so we trust Him, we place our faith in Him, knowing full well that He will deliver us, and, uh, and he will, he's done it before, he will do it again. And so, um, so now, I know that maybe some of you are thinking, so what now? What's going to happen? Oh, dude, what's going to happen to us as a church? Well, for the most part, not much will change for many of us. Um, because I think it's God's grace to us that it's happened now and not maybe in the autumn, like September, October, when we've kind of all moved back into the space and we've worked really hard at gathering you all back to church and all of the procedures, etc., etc. That would have been a real bummer, to say the least. But it's happened now and not then. That's God's grace to us. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to pack the church up, pack it up into boxes. Uh, please watch your emails uh, Sarah will let you all know. She'll make those things public today. If you have church suite on your phone, you'll see it as a featured event. And we will have evenings in the week uh, whereby you'll be able to come along and with others and pack up the church. And we will help you and we'll do that. We've risk, as risk assessed the heck out of the evening. So don't worry about if you'll be at risk. There'll only be six people in the building at a time and you'll get given a particular task to do. And then once you've done it, you'd move on. Um, so check your emails for those, um, sign up for those events. Maybe as a gospel community, you want to take on one of those nights and uh, get six of you down as a gospel community and come and pack up a particular room or whatever else that needs to happen. And our last Sunday in this building is the Sunday after Easter, which is the 12th of April. But uh, 11th is moving day, a Saturday. I think Sunday is the 12th. No? Oh, I got it wrong. Anyway, that last Sunday <laughs> in April is the moving 
day, but we will move the church on the Saturday, which I thought was the 11th, but maybe I'm wrong, it's the 10th. So that weekend is moving day, Sunday, last Sunday. We won't pe probably have people in the building because we would have packed up all the chairs and done all of that kind of malarkey, but um, we will still live stream from this space. So um, we need guys to help us on moving day, and um, we will kind of put people in slots of two hours at a time, and all the boxes will be packed in the main space, and you would come and grab boxes and just load them up into your car. We've uh, potentially hired a storage unit in the city center that we'll kind of drop all the stuff off at. And uh, for the most part, we will just carry on live streaming to your home. So, hey, not much has really changed. We only plan to be in the main space on the 24th of May, and we're really hoping that something will come up between now and then, and then we can kind of still keep to the plan of gathering the church together in a larger amount every single Sunday from then on. Um, if that doesn't happen, what we plan to do is once a month, we'll have an all-church gathering and we'll hire a conference center or we'll hire a space that we could gather as much of us as possible on that one Sunday. And then the other three Sundays in that week, you would just do church at home. But the other plus side is that from Easter weekend, you can have six people in your yard, if you have one, uh, outdoors. And so you could do church at your house. And if someone doesn't have a yard, why don't you invite them to your house if you have a yard and do church together outside. Six of you can be outside um, from that Sunday, uh, the 4th of April, which is Easter Sunday. And then from the 23rd of May, that Sunday, you can have six people inside your house. So you can start to invite people. If we can't find a big conference space to, to meet, you can invite six people to come to your house. You can either do breakfast together or do lunch together and do church together. It's a great opportunity. And you're allowed to gather 30 people outdoors. Whoop! I'm up to ramming my backyard. No, we're going to do that social distance, I think. But you can have 30 people outdoors. So maybe we can even be creative if the weather's good. Who knows? It's a great um, season to be alive in Cornerstone Church, a great opportunity for us as a church. So not all is lost. Sure enough, we can't all kind of be together, um, but it just means we're just going to operate a little bit differently for the next couple of months. So now that you know the plan, uh, could I please ask you as the church, let us be a praying church. Let's pray. Let's pray petitionary prayers Let's trust God for a breakthrough with our building. Um, hey, this might just be a catalyst for a bold move. Maybe this is the nudge that we, we I kind of call it the Goldilocks syndrome, where it's too hot or it's too cold or it's too far, it's too close, it's too this, it's too that. But maybe this is just a catalyst for us to make a bold move. Maybe you want to, as a GC, next week, dedicate some time to pray. Maybe as a GC, you want to fast. Uh, fasting doesn't have to necessarily be food. Maybe you want to fast from social media or, or anything like that. You remember, we don't fast to twist God's arm. Uh, we can't do that, but we fast because it helps us to focus our prayers, turn our attention off of ourselves and see the risen King, see God who is seated high above all things, in control of all things. So, um, so fast, fast and pray. Let's great opportunity to unite the church and bring us together. You can come out and you can help us pack. Sarah is busy with all of those things, and so info will come out to you. But moving day is the 10th of April, that's the Saturday, and last day at church is the 12th. 11th. You'll get it. In your calendar, I think it's like second week. Uh, it's the week after Easter. There you go. Boom. And um, yeah, it will be risk assessed if you want to see all those kinds of things to help you, get, give you confidence to come into the space. Please ask us. And lastly, please tell your friends about what is happening so that we can celebrate what God will do in and through this. It will be a testimony of God's provision a testimony of God's providence, and hey, who knows, some networking or something might happen that we might be able to, um, God will be able to join the dots through that. So let's expect great things. Amen? 
So we're going to sing. What happened? July 5th, 12, so. <laughs> when was that? Oh, one minute ago. Not that bad. You're in the building. We get to worship. <laughs> uh, why did it do that? Anyway, not, not. Let's stand. Probably doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a GC leaders meeting last night where Mike kind of teed us up for this. And there was so much um, encouragement and hope expressed uh, in that meeting um, after the announcement was made. Um, Grace Barker reminded us that so often we love to sing Waymaker. Uh, Waymaker, Miracle Maker, Promise Keeper. Uh, now's the bit where we actually have to like believe this. Um, so I want to call us to pray and to worship off the back of this response in hope that God is going to provide for us, in confident hope that God is going to provide for us. We were chatting with Neil beforehand, and he was saying how at some point, however many months' time, we're going to look back on this moment and be like, yeah, that's where we called out to God and God delivered for us. Uh, so yeah, in expectation of that, let's let's sing this song together. Um, yeah, and let's pray. Uh, pray while we do. Call out to God. Ask him to provide for us.
trust in your goodness, we trust in your provision. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So there's a building somewhere that you can give us. And we trust you, Jesus, and we look forward to the day and yeah, however many weeks or months time it is when we can look back and say, yes, God provided for us. See what the Lord has done. See what he has given to us. So we call out our faith in you now, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you would bless us in the weeks to come. Uh, with pictures and words and encouragements and prophecy and provision and money coming out of nowhere. Uh, yeah, we look forward to being able to, to tell stories of your goodness and your provision for us, Lord God. We trust you. Amen. Amen. is on or not? Oh, it is on. Great, because there is no live feed, so we can do what we want. Hello, hey. Whoa, look at that. They'll never see it. Hey, right, brilliant. Um, <laughs> I hope that's not live. We're definitely not live, are we? Great, brilliant. Well, you can do what you want. I've always wanted to every morning that it started. That's, is it? Oh, you're joking. <laughs> well, hello, evening service. Brilliant, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> don't put that. Don't put that on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> thanks so much for coming along, you guys in the building, you people online that never saw. I am um, Tim Tasha. Thanks, Mike. All the guys behind the scenes. Um, I was going to encourage people for prayer in the building. If you're looking for prayer, then please get prayer. Um, but in the nicest way possible, please get out because you're not meant to stick around and mingle. So, goodbye. See you later. Thanks very much. <laughs>